My name is Emily. Welcome to my garden. It's the place where dreams are cultivated. I have a great show planned for you today. You see, today is the first day of fall and I've been making wreaths to sell at Farmer's Market. Come on inside and I'll show you how it's done. As you know, Emily's Garden was never meant to be a how-to gardening series. It's a lifestyle show. Usually we leave from my garden and go somewhere, but today, today I'm going to show you a little bit about what I do to prepare for the winter and it involves a harvest. The wreaths that I'm going to show you how to make basically are going to be made out of this. Yes ladies and gentlemen a weed is but an unloved flower. This is wild artemisia. I find that it's a lovely addition to the fall and believe it or not you can get it by the waysides because it is a weed a weed is but an unloved flower, and we're going to put this weed to work today. Artemisia vulgaris, or common wormwood, is one of the several species in the genus Artemisia, which have common names that include the word mugwort. In the European Middle Ages, mugwort was used as a magical protective herb to repel insects, especially moths, from the garden. Also used from ancient times as a remedy against fatigue and to protect travelers against evil spirits and wild animals. In fact, Roman soldiers put mugwort in their sandals to protect their feet against fatigue. It flowers from July to September. It's native to Europe, Asia, Northern Africa, and Alaska. It is a very common plant that grows on uncultivated areas such as waste places and roadsides. It has naturalized in North America, where some consider it an invasive weed. I'm sure everyone has these hangers somewhere in your closet and they usually look like this. Don't throw them away anymore. They are a great base for your wreaths. They easily bend into a circle. Don't have to be perfect. It's going to be covered with the artemisia. What I generally do is take that top part, bend it over, and again this is something that most everyone has at their fingertips. A lot of plastic hangers out there on the market now, but I believe these are still around. You can, I think, still buy these crimp rings. But again, anything that's at your fingertips and can be recycled, especially if they've been hanging up in that closet looking like that, grab them and we'll start making a wreath today. Try to set my table up a little bit for you. We'll move this like so. Okay, so we have a clean palette. We have our ring ready. The next part of the process, again, I try to save as much money as I possibly can. In the old days, I used to buy a crimp ring, and I used to cover this with Spanish moss. Why do you ask? Well, when you start to weave your wreath, it will slip on the metal, so you need something for it to adhere to. And what I do now is simply take the material that I'm using, and I start to cover the ring. Get yourself a nice supply of wire as you start to make these wreaths. And you can see how quickly that it all starts to go. It doesn't really matter. You're not going to see any of this. The only reason that you're really doing it, as I said, is so that your material that you start to stack on top of the ring won't slip. Wire is important too. There are different gauges. Now you'll notice that I start snapping these back. And I do this because I don't like to waste anything. The wire comes in different gauges. This is a relatively thin gauged wire that I'm using right now, but I could very easily have used a thicker one. It's what I grabbed when I went to the store. Okay, now you'll notice that I am not cutting this. You have formed a circle. Did you notice that when I flipped that, you could see the white of the ring? I'm going to flip it this way and cover this side so that the back will be all of the same material and you will never see that hanger at all. 
just a simple little twist. It just makes all the difference in how professional it looks at the end. Okay, so let's lay that down. Make sure that you prepare your wire. And the way I do this is I like to work this way. And you're going to see how quickly this goes. This is called stacking. Now you notice how that I bent that backwards. The other thing that I will do is take these pieces and bring them forward until I have a nice little bundle. Then I place it on the top of the ring, like so, and begin to wrap. I also want to make sure that my wire is tight. And I must say, this is thin wire, and sometimes I don't know my own strength, so I may snap it at some point, which is one reason why I usually do get a little thicker wire than that. But this will do. Again, I'm stacking. Now I pick this weed up by the wayside, and as I said, a weed is but an unloved flower. It remains green for probably about two months, and then it will turn brown, but that's okay for the fall season. When I go to gather my artemisia, I try to get something that's nice and full like this. And this is the reason, because it cuts my work in half. Snap. 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 And snap. Look at the nice little bundle I have. And again, give it girth, pull it back. That's hanging off the edge, don't want it there. Very nicely done. Now what I do is one here and one here. And this is how all wreaths are made. I've made some wonderful hydrangea wreaths this year for Farmer's Market. Last year during a freak snowstorm, I should say an ice storm, in late October, I lost a tree. And lo and behold, I ended up with a lot of sun in my front yard. My backyard is mostly half day, so I haven't been able to grow some of the things that I would have loved to. One of those things were zinnias. Well, sir, I put in about 10 raised beds, grew my vegetables, and the most beautiful crop of zinnias you ever want to see. We sold them at Farmer's Market. This weekend was the last weekend for me to be able to sell them, and at the end of the show, I'm going to show you a nice little arrangement that you can make with zinnias and hydrangeas. Zinnias come in a wide array of colors, including cream, yellow, orange, and red. Some are bicolored and streaked, whereas others sport interesting speckles. Species of zinnias grow anywhere from 6 to 36 inches high, depending on the variety. And their tendency to attract butterflies and hummingbirds is seen as desirable. Their ability to attract hummingbirds is also seen as useful as a defense against white flies. Beware though, zinnias are prone to powdery mildew in all but the most arid regions of the country. Minimize problems by planting zinnias where they will get plenty of sun. Seeds can be sown directly in the soil a quarter inch deep and a few inches apart, then to 6 to 12 inches depending on the variety's mature height. After frost, tear out and discard plants. You can save your zinnia seeds for next year's planting by simply saving the spent blossoms place them in a paper bag to dry. You can dry them on screens first if you like, but both methods work well. Just be sure to let them complete the process in a cool, dry place, preferably away from sunlight. We keep continuing around like so. You take these side shoots if you want. And again. And again, and again. How pretty is that already? There are a lot of things in the wild right at your fingertips. You have to know a little bit about the plant, obviously. You should never take all of it. Now, my daughter went foraging for me. I asked her to get me something called sumac. No, not poison sumac. Poison sumac has white berries. Isn't that beautiful? 
Now I'm bringing this out now because I'm going to weave this right into the wreath to show you that you can do it in several different ways. You can add other material as you're weaving a wreath, which will change it drastically. Or you can hot glue them in afterwards, which I do often. I'm going to leave these here and talk about the sumac a little bit. Staghorn sumac grows in gardens, lawns, the edges of forests, and wastelands. It can grow under a wide array of conditions, but is most often found in dry and poor soil on which other plants cannot survive. Sumacs propagate both by seed, spread by birds and other animals, and by new shoots or rhizomes. Candles produced from sumac wax burn with smokeless flame and were favored in many respects over candles made from lard or beeswax. It is still used in many tropical and subtropical countries in the production of wax match sticks. In North America, smooth sumac and staghorn sumac are sometimes used to make a beverage termed sumac aid or Indian lemonade. Sumac was used as a treatment for half a dozen different ailments in medieval medicine. An 11th century shipwreck excavated by archaeologists in the 1970s contained commercial quantities of sumac berries. These could have been intended for use as medicine, as a culinary spice, or as a dye. Sumac stems also have a soft pith in the center that is useful in traditional Native American pipe making. They were commonly used as pipe stems in the northern United States. Some species, such as poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac, have properties that contain an allergen that can cause severe allergic reactions. Poison sumac may be identified by its white berries. I use this often in Christmas work because I like the color. It lends itself to more of a colonial Christmas than that bright red that you often get. Sumac is actually something that the chickadees like to eat. You can see I'm touching it freely, I'm not itching, it's fine. It does, again, grow in barren areas, and you'll see it by the wayside. You'll see it in the middle of the city, growing up by a building. Don't take it all, because the birds do like to eat it. We're going to just take this now, and I'm going to put one here. I might snip the tail end of that off like so. And I'm going to continue on with my mugwort, which of course is the wild artemisia. Bent it backwards to make the girth, and now it is going to go on top of this. Lovely. Again, if you have to do a little snip here and there, that's okay. So last year, I lost a couple of big old oak trees in my front yard. I took the opportunity, now that I had full day sun, to put in some raised beds so that I could raise some zinnias for farmer's market. I got an added plus that I really hadn't anticipated. You see, I raised butterflies as well. And those plants were just absolutely covered with them all summer long. And I was able to capture on film, which I'm going to show you now, the full life cycle of the butterfly. What I generally do is I go out and I find the butterfly egg on milkweed, another unloved flower I might add. It has a long tap root and it's very hard to propagate, so I usually go out and look for them. I call that butterflying. Those are my butterfly days. So this is what they look like. When they hatch, a very tiny little monarch caterpillar is going to appear on that leaf and start eating. And it will eat and eat and eat. I think I had 23 going at once. It looked like a sci-fi movie by the end of the season. I think I'm about ready for another piece of sumac here. So we're going to snip one of those. Now I have one here, so I'm going to put one here. And the next one's going to go on this side. Where was I? I was talking about the caterpillars. Now I put them in an atrium so that I can watch their process and I do release them. 
A simple atrium of sorts can be made from a mason jar in screening, believe it or not. Just cut a circle the size of the lid of the jar. Glue the screen to the screw band. Voila, you have a home to house the eggs you find on warm butterfly and days in the summer. And one day, they'll climb up to the top or sometimes the side of the atrium and they will hang in what is called a J stage, where they're actually shaped like this and this is what that looks like. Now they're going to do that for a little while, then they're going to begin their metamorphosis and that is to turn into a chrysalis. And I captured this not only once this summer, I mean really, what a plus, but three times. Watch this. Okay, we're ready for the third piece of sumac. That's gonna go right here. And don't worry if it's not exactly perfect, because don't forget, when we get done, we're still going to probably hot glue some stuff in here. Okay. There's a beautiful butterfly Indian legend that says that since the butterfly cannot speak, if you whisper your wish to it, when you release the butterfly, it will fly up to the heavens and your wish will be granted. So again, not only once, but several times this summer, I was able to capture on film when the butterfly came out of its chrysalis to emerge into a beautiful butterfly. And of course this year I had all those zinnias that I could put them on afterwards. Fall is always a little bittersweet for me, no pun intended. I really love the season. But in all honesty, we're getting ready for winter, which I finally call the white season. You can see how nice and full this already is. Okay, ready for another sumac. And here we are. See how we're doing a stagger all the way through? And again, if you get to talking like I do and you make a little poopa, you, you can always fix that at the end with some hot glue and a couple other little flowers. 
Now I started talking about the hydrangeas a minute ago. I'm going to just kind of backtrack a little bit. Mostly for fresh, I've been using the Endless Summer to go with my zinnias. I find that they really complement each other. The fall hydrangeas that most people buy because they want them to be used in wreaths is a PG hydrangea and that comes in bush and tree form. PG standing for paniculata grandiflora. There's also a variety called Tardiva. And I have a friend that has been letting me reap her bushes. So I have a little surprise for her later. We're going to dress that wreath. And when I say dress it, I mean we're going to decorate it a little bit more than just the base, which it is totally made of her flowers. Her and his flowers. My friends, the Clows in Rehoboth, have been very good to me by sharing the fruits of their gardens. OK, we're getting there. In fact, I decorate my hallway, believe it or not, with the PG hydrangeas. To dry flowers correctly, you really should hang them in a cool, dry place away from sunlight. And I have an area in my hallway that I've set up, which of course fits exactly that criteria. And I enjoy the pretty flowers as I walk down the hall and remember summer all through the winter. Well, there comes a time, and it really isn't until just about this time of year where I'm going to replace those flowers, that they have, in fact, faded a little bit. But they're not done yet. I can still use them. I might want to bring a little more color to them. And they do sell paint for that, spray paint. It's called Design Master, and that's probably just a brand name. I don't see why you couldn't use any other kind of paint, because what I usually do is just put it in a box outside and give it a little spritz. And voila, fresh again and ready to add to my wreaths. And we're getting towards the end of this wreath. Now you'll notice that I start to pull this back, and there's a reason for that. A circle means infinity. And the word itself means infinite. So as we end this, we want to make sure that we don't see where we started or where we ended it. And because I do most of my wreaths fresh and then I let them dry this way, it makes it much more easier for me to mold them. What you're going to see now is me starting to tuck under the first layer, like so. How pretty is that already? Now, even when the artemisia starts to turn brown, you're going to see that nice, subtle burgundy color of the sumac. And we're going to add some other fallish colors to it. And again, I don't want you to see where I started. So I might give it one more wrap right there. And when I finish with the hot glue, if I have to, if it looks like there's a seam, then I'll add to it at that point, like so. I think that about does it. OK. I think I have my hot melt just about ready. So I'm going to clear this table for a minute, set up an easel, and I'll see you in a minute. Here's some remnants of a few hydrangeas. I'm just going to do a little tuck here and there, and you'll notice how it fills that wreath in unbelievably. Go like this, it takes a lot of the strings away that happen naturally. Now you'll also notice that what I do is I put it behind the sumac. It not only makes it look fuller, but the added color makes that stand out tenfold. And don't forget, the green that you're seeing in the artemisia right now is soon going to be brown. So you will have a difference in color there. Okay? Be very careful with that glue gun. I have the scars to show it, too. You don't have to lift up the glue gun. You can just leave it down. Okay? I like to pull up my leaves so that they're close, because I'm not going to use all of those stems. You should use wire cutters for this if you can. Again, stem. 
one, two. See how I'm going around so that they're fairly evenly spaced. They don't have to be perfect. They shouldn't be. I'm going to show you that set points can be used in other ways. When I say set points, usually five will complete a circle. And again, whatever is pleasing to the eye. Another thing that is at your fingertips this time of year, grasses. How pretty is that? And I have to put some purple in there. It just makes it look fallish. Now most of these flowers, <laughs> I hate to tell you, but I got them at the dollar store. And you can see that one bunch of flowers generally has about five stems on it. Again, you're kind of doing the stacking thing with this, and you could do it with wire if you wanted to. Insert it underneath the artemisia, like so. And let it do its own rhythm. I call it free flow form. Don't try to change the way that it wants to move. It has movement already. Beauteous. These are pitch pine. At least in New England, they're very plentiful. And I'm going to finish this off. Again, that's three. And what would an autumn wreath be without a few leaves here and there? If you want, you can pick up a little raffia just to finish it off. You can see how that color makes everything pop. And often what I'll do with this is just tie it up. Notice I'm not going into any fancy bows. I've long since lost that love for that look, which was quite popular in its day. And we're just going to put this in, tuck it, tie it back. And then just like you're fixing your hair to go out and you don't have a brush, just do one of these. Perfect. OK, and I just want to show you a little bit of what we were talking about before with the other wreaths. This is made out of the hydrangea tardiva. And you can see it really didn't need very much at all. It's going to be a gift to my friends. OK, show's almost over, but I want to just show you one more thing. I did a wedding a few weeks ago. Very, very good friend of mine got married. And we used mason jars. And I did 50 arrangements. And I'm telling you, they went very quickly. And they really weren't very expensive. She had the hydrangeas. I cut the zinnias from my garden. And voila, I've been saving cans as well. Now, I left the wrapper on this one because, you know what? <laughs> That's kind of appealing, too, in the farmer's market. But if you want to take off the wrapper and just have the can itself, it's really very quaint. So what I'm going to do with these hydrangeas is have them act not so much as an accent, but as my floral foam. They're going to hold my zinnias in place. So you can see we pretty much formed a circle. What I'm going to do now is go in between. And because these hydrangeas are so beautiful, I'm probably going to let some of the blue flower show. If I wanted to make this look exactly like a little posy, I could cover each and every inch of this. And there you have it. We part until we meet again. See you next time here in Emily's Garden. <laughs> Big away. <sighs> it's right around your headphones. <laughs> you got two of them. <laughs> Outtake. Oh Invasion of bees. Oh my Cam God, Mom, I'm gonna freak out. Camera lady. I'm trying to freak out. <laughs> Bees are your friends. They pollinate the flowers. It is why we have food and flowers. I know, but they're not great when I eat. They don't eat much. Huh? All right, get back on camera, girl. Right. I also want to make sure that my wire is tight. And I must say, this is thin wire, and sometimes I don't know my own strength. So I may snap it at some point, which is one reason why I usually do get a little bit of, of a thicker wire than that. But this will do. Some one. There it goes. <laughs> I won't show that. It's always something.